say in the beginning, it often starts with some kind of um, efficiency issue. That is, how can we automate certain activities in order to be uh, more efficient? Uh, I think that's maybe the, the most low-hanging fruit for AI, to I- increase efficiency. Hello, I'm welcome. The following is a conversation with Per Andersson, professor at Stockholm School of Economics. Through his research, he works with the study of the impacts of artificial intelligence and its implementations in different types of operations across different businesses and organizations. I was honored that he agreed to participate in this podcast. I am Abed Fayez, and this is the AI Pod. I hope that you enjoy the program. How would you define your work in terms of uh, the applications of AI for organizations? You, my work, yes. Well, m- my research work right now is actually, uh, you, you can say it covers three different areas and <laughs> it's dealing all with consequences of AI implementation. So what we're looking at is... Uh, Uh, if we start on the micro level, sort of business processes, how are they affected by the implementation of AI and how are organizations and organizational structures uh, affected by by AI. But then we're also moving up a step and looking at, well, in the long term, how will it affect the company's business models and also maybe strategies. And on the third level, higher level, we're also touching upon, uh, you can say, the systemic level, when you implement AI, it will have consequences for the industrial systems, um, who is doing what, the distribution of work. So we, are, you can say that the research project that I'm into now, it's covering, uh, trying to cover all these three levels and how they are interrelated. But you also work with digitization for a very long time. Yeah. How would you describe yeah. what AI is and digitization is uh, and what's, how would you define them in a way that sh- so mm. that you could differentiate between them? I, I think that this is a very a good question. My, to me right now, I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing AI as a little bit of a continuation of, of digitalization and digital transformation. Um, I mean, uh, if we start with digitalization, I think we need to sort of separate digitization and digitalization and also maybe digital transformation, and that's what we've been studying. So we've been focusing on previously on digitalization, which includes the sort of business aspect, the te- technical, technological, and the business aspects of uh, <coughs> digital uh, changes, digitalization changes. Uh, AI I- is a little bit more tricky. Uh, I would say that when, I, when I'm studying this in literature and how other researchers approach AI, I would say that they, they, there are three different ways that the researchers seem to sort of uh, approach AI. AI is a scientific discipline, or AI as um, different technologies used to realize AI. And then you can say the more organizational-oriented researchers talk about AI capabilities, that is, what are the organizational capabilities to actually use AI and use these diverse set of sort of technical tools. So there's different ways of, of approaching uh, AI. Um, you can say that, w- well, I, I would define it, I have, a, uh, I have a definition here which I think is, is more in line with what we are doing. And AI is, is the ability of a system to identify, interpret, make inferences and learn from data to achieve predetermined organizational and societal goals. So that to me is my sort of take on AI right now, looking at more a, 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 as a system rather than focusing um, more closely on each and one of these new technologies emerging around AI, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, NLP, chatbots, or or combinations of them all, uh, et cetera. So it's more on the uh, uh, AI's abilities, yeah. So you would say that the difference is that keyword of learnability uh, capabilities mm, yes uh, yeah compared to just it, yeah and i i think this is sort of movement from digitalization to you can say that i think there was an intermediate concept datafication 
between digitalization and AI, we had some some used the word datafication, and maybe that's one of the bridges between digitalization and AI. That is the increased importance of, of data and how we treat data and how we use data in, in organizations. I would say that that's maybe the, uh, the bridge, the important bridge between. As you mentioned, AI can have a very broad definition, very many different <coughs> techniques. Mm. Uh, so how in your work do you try to apply all of these different techniques to different organizational and societal uh, uses. Okay, I, I would say that we approach it the other way around. We don't bother well what kind of AI technology that, that is used. We, we're looking at the use as such. What is it used for uh, in, in different sort of organizational activities? Uh, and it could, I mean, sometimes it's a bit sort of combination of different sort of technologies. Um, so so we, we start from the actual application and use of it. So I would say that it is a sort of little bit less important. Uh, of course, it's inter interesting to, for us to understand, trying to understand, as not being an engineer, so trying to understand what can the different technologies do. Of course, we need to sort of approach it that way too. But we start from the, the, the applications, you can say. Uh, whether we are studying it in marketing activities, in procurement activities, whether it's uh, studied in, in, in how management to make decisions with support of AI, etc., etc. But um, uh, we, we, we're trying to cover a, a quite a broad set of, um, you can say, organizational functions where, where AI can be applied. And in different functions, there are different sort of technologies used. <coughs> and the results of your work and mm. uh, what your research is about, how can businesses try to apply uh, your studies in their work? How can businesses apply different mm. Uh, mm. AI uh, mm. techniques in their work? Mm. I think what, what we, uh, our re research is trying to do is to, to trying to uncover, for example, what are the different sort of enablers and also maybe inhibitors, hindrances for implementing AI. And, and I mean, our, f our end results end up very much in words and models and concepts uh, and ideas. Uh, so hopefully some of these, um, uh, you can say, empirical studies that we are doing following uh, companies, whether they are uh, AI developers or whether they are users of AI, what are the different sort of um, uh, challenges they are facing when it, when implementing AI? So <coughs> the end result is maybe some in improved knowledge, increased in-depth knowledge about what are the challenges we are facing when we are implementing AI and how can we come across them and how are different companies and, and organizations <coughs> been handling these, uh, these challenges and, and sort of condense that knowledge into models, concepts, etc. That, that's what our in, end results are. So there is a sentence that is necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, would you say that with the applications of AI, we are talking about such a concept as well? I mean, it is purely based on the absolute necessities that these companies face in applying AI. That's they bring it on or um, I'm not sure if I understand the question that you s mean that it should be a necessity to implement it uh, oh no I mean necessity uh, simply that a company wants to do something mm. and uh, the best solution perhaps is through the use of AI Okay. Is that when yeah. they yeah. think of yeah. implementing it? Mm. I want to mm. uh, okay. take a yeah. deeper dive in uh, yeah. when they <coughs> I think you you can approach that from uh, different angles. I think uh, I think what I see today is that there's a lot of general sort of buzz and interest in all types of organizations, small and, and big business organizations, and also in in, in public organizations and governmental agencies, etc., which we are interviewing right now. There's a big buzz and a big uh, interest in in AI, but I think. Uh, those who are um, successful, actually, with implementing AI, 
they have not starting from started from well they have started from sort of understanding a little bit more what AI is, have some kind of, of, of basic understanding of AI. But then they have sort of turned to the, uh, the organization, what are our uh, present sort of pressing issues? What is it that we, uh, we are uh, struggling with in organization? Whether it, it relates to in, in increased efficiency in certain areas. So I think the... the uh, the implementation of AI, that's maybe if I should u- use the word should, uh, I, I seldom do that, but <laughs> I think you should start with a problem. What, what kind of problem is it that AI should solve? And understanding in depth that, that issue, then I think it's easier for organizations to start using AI as the solution to, to that problem. Um, and it's often, I, I would say in the beginning, it often starts with some kind of um, efficiency issue. That is, how can we automate certain activities in order to be uh, more efficient? Uh, I think that's maybe the, the most low-hanging fruit for AI, to I- increase efficiency. And then we are sort of touching upon these uh, sort of big questions about labor, etc., etc. But I think that's where, where companies are starting. Um, that is... How can AI help us to to uh, increase or improve our um, efficiency, y- use our resources, whether it's personnel, in a more efficient way, reduce the number of work hours for, for certain maybe more tedious type of, of um, uh, work activities. Um, so there I think we have uh, an important... Um, uh, I don't know if I would call it necessity, but... but yeah, well, uh, that that's I think where where there's an e- e- where there is a very good way for organizations to start thinking about AI as the tool. Uh, uh, when we talk about AI, we talk about sometimes relatively expensive tools, mm-hmm. and uh, some companies that are relatively larger mm-hmm. have a very uh, deeper and broader uh, perspective of trying to make this organization more efficient at all times. Whereas smaller organizations have a very harder time trying to exactly mm. both mm. afford technologies that increase their efficiency. Yeah. yeah. So how can small businesses try to mm. apply different mm. uh, types of AI in their business yeah. to be able to compete yeah. with larger businesses? Uh, that's probably a very, very good question. I mean... Um, uh, wh- if we compare with digitalization, to, for example, pre- uh, 10 years ago, I think uh, small companies were, in general, lagging behind, well, I- we if they were not sort of digital startups and that kind of companies. But I think uh, what happened there is, of course, that some of these uh, digital tools that they later on started to implement, they became off-the-shelf products. So maybe we are in the same situation now. That is, uh, well, AI is, is fairly uh, expensive right now. It's, it's uh, costly. But, I mean, as time passes, I think we will see much more, and maybe quite uh, quite fast, off-the-shelf products. I mean, open AI sources, et cetera, et cetera, that small companies can more, more easily adopt. Uh, so I think... Yes, today big organizations are probably more on the forefront of, of trying and using AI solutions uh, internally and, and, and externally in, in relationship to other customers, etc. But I would say that um, with time and maybe more quickly than we think, we will see much, much more of uh, open AI sources and platforms. But if you look at the market right now mm. in terms mm. of the AI companies that provide perhaps, as you uh, said, off-the-shelf type Mm. of uh, products to different companies. Mm. There are very relatively few companies that have that type of uh, really uh, at the uh, edge uh, techniques that Mm. many might want to buy Mm. uh, because it's very relatively expensive to develop these. Do you think that there is a possibility of it remaining relatively expensive for a long time? <coughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, that's a very difficult question to answer. Maybe maybe um, it could be 
different depending on what business area we're talking about. Uh, because I think some some industries and some applications area, uh, application areas are probably more on the forefront than others. So I think maybe we need to see it uh, from, from what industry and what application area we're talking about. Uh, I can't give you an example, but, uh, b- but that's at, at least what we've seen in, in other areas, that there, there are some, some areas that are much more in, in the forefront. And uh, um, maybe we can, if we talk rather than industries, if we talk about uh, organizational functions, well, one of the areas that we have seen is, is uh, and has been there, this has been there for long, uh, is in the marketing area. We have lots of di- different sort of uh, AI-based uh, marketing applications that are becoming uh, maybe uh, less costly w- quite rapidly. Um, so I think, uh, and marketing has always been in the forefront of AI adoption, I would say. Wh- when you I- investigate o- organizations and w- what internal functions is it that are most rapidly adopting AI, I- it's, you can say, on average, it's definitely the marketing uh, operations. Uh, because they have been working with big uh, customer data uh, and uh, customer data analysis uh, for very long. So I- I- it's, I- it's not so, pr- so surprising. And maybe there, uh, I'm just speculating now, maybe in that area we will see uh, more of uh, uh, less costly, at least, uh, AI applications coming to market. Yeah. It is uh, always interesting when one thinks about the competitive aspect of businesses providing these type of mm. uh, services to uh, different customers. Uh, but we talked about the fact that these techniques arise from uh, the needs of companies. Mm. How can, from an economic perspective, companies try to recognize areas of need that they themselves might not necessarily be aware of even? Mm. I think I can come back to my previous point there. I, I think if you start looking at your organization and w- what are the issues that we need to solve here in the organization, and I, I think I- if you start with the sort of uh, efficiency-related uh, challenges that the company has, then I think you can quite easily, I guess, I- in most organizations, identify uh, problems that can be solved with AI. So I, I would say that if we, if we divide w- what, what can AI be applied for in organizations, I think starting with efficiency, but I think the more tricky aspects are probably uh, the next step when you're going to use it for uh, effectiveness, that is developing uh, improved services or new types of services for customers and others. And maybe in, in, the, in the third step, how can we use AI for our long-term innovation processes in organizations. I don't think so many companies are there yet. So I think starting with understanding the, the efficiency-related w- uh, issues in organizations, maybe that's the tactic to get into AI use. Um, and these innovation processes, do you mean that companies might use these type of innovation, I- a type of innovative uh, AI to think about what the company might lead to in the future? Yeah, yeah I think so. I, I think there's a good opportunity to use AI. Uh, I don't know uh, how many are doing it today, but I mean, a, the, the type of new type of analysis that you can get out of a, an AI solution is, is quite interesting. I, I think also, uh, I c- maybe I can give you an example. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, um, back to marketing, uh, and, and I mean in, in, the, in the marketing area, I, we know that customers are uh, can now uh, access quite uh, large amounts of, of, of long-term data. So we have the g- opportunity to do some very good uh, AI-based analysis of uh, customer behavior. Uh, yeah, everything related to, to marketing sales and, and long-term customer contacts and interactions. Um, and y- if you do that, if you use that big data, I think you can come across, for example, I mean, in marketing, we talk about marketing segmentation. 
I think you can discover, and that's maybe the first step towards innovation, we can discover completely new market segments uh, with the help of AI data. And uh, maybe, as I said, maybe that's the first step towards some kind of, let's say, uh, market innovation. Jeff Bezos, the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Amazon, has a word he likes to use very much, the customer obsession. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I think when you talk about marketing, you're talking slightly perhaps about the fact that AI can help companies recognize exactly what type of uh, desires their customers have. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that type of customer obsession is going to be something that a broader number of companies are going to be adapting as the core model? Mm, I, I, I think so. I think it was the same observation when we started looking at uh, digitalization, digital transformation. Uh, uh, I would say that m much of that was driven by uh, an increased, uh, let's say, between the closeness to customers that you we were able, or companies were able to, to, to um, uh, understand customers and customer behavior in a, in a much more profound way than earlier. And I think it's the same with AI, where maybe AI is taking it another step here. And, but then we have, and, and then maybe we should start talking also about uh, things like trust, privacy, integrity is issues. I think uh, that is something that we also need to, to keep in mind, that th those issues are, with AI coming up much, much more to surface, uh, which we sort of need to sort of also understand. Um, Another aspect which I think, maybe th this can sound like a sidetrack, but I, I'm thinking about customer, the, the customer concept. Um, uh, I think, well, one, f one first idea came up in my head when I think about customers is that we also citizens. That is, uh, we, we also, I think we shouldn't forget the public sphere that is, the public organizations, which we are interacting with as citizens. We're not only sort of uh, customers to commercial companies, we're also citizens. So I think there's something that we also need to sort of um, have a sort of have in the back of our head. How can we, as citizens, be helped by uh, our governmental organizations being equipped more with AI and understanding our behavior in a better way. The second thing that comes up in my head is, uh, and that relates AI to IoT, Internet of Things. Um, and I, I'm thinking about uh, machines, artifacts becoming customers. That is, with AI, we will also see uh, uh, in the future, and we connect AI to these growing Internet of Things systems where machines are interacting with other machines. Uh, then, of course, machines uh, will become our customers. That is, if we connect, uh, uh, let's see, we have a coffee brewer here in the room. If we connect a coffee brewer to AI and uh, let the, the coffee brewer machine signal 24-7 uh, uh, how much coffee is left uh, or what kind of parts of the coffee machine that's uh, become getting more and more worn when, when we it can automatically signal uh, that well now it's time for a spare part uh, and then uh, this you can say maybe we can see the coffee machine or whether it's a refrigerator or any other type of, of artifact or machine uh, that we are interacting with, uh, with the help of AI, becomes the customer, and we can automatically order a, a new spare part to a, to an e-commerce site. So I think the the interesting thing with AI also that we mm, there's some kind of interesting blurred boundaries between what is a customer here. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, <laughs> yeah. but if we begin with your first point, uh, there is a lot of what we mentioned is uh, the more back-end type of mm -hmm. uh, uses of AI that mm. many of the users might not even be aware of. Mm. And as you raise it, there is a question of ethics there. Mm. How much do you think companies and organizations and governments should 
mention to the citizen the use of AI mm. in the back mm. end? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's, it's a really good question, and, and it's a question pr- pro that needs to be raised all the time. Uh, and I mean, th- I think most of the discussions concern uh, the increased need for transparency. Uh, I think that's that's maybe a general topic that needs to be discussed all the time. And it, it I think it, it's important for all spheres that are using uh, AI in some way, whether it's a public or private area. That is, we need to make these AI, um, uh, let's say, AI algorithms more transparent. Uh, which is, of course, a, a challenge. I mean, it's a pedagogical challenge because then it's, it's sometimes very advanced. But I think w- still we need to sort of... Um, uh, we need to be aware of this. And, and I mean, for example, if, if we're talking about the public sphere and we're talking about medical doctors, if they are going to be able to trust AI as, as part of the maybe frontline or back office sort of functions, they they probably need to have a basic understanding of what uh, ML, ma- machine learning, for example, can do and how it works in order to, to trust the system and, and to, to trust the, uh, the AI uh, solution and system uh, uh, assisting the, the physician in, in some kind of decision making. So I think transparency and, and, and improved, let's say, some kind of pedagogical uh, pedagogical way of explaining AI to all, all users. I mean, that's part of it. And I think it's a very, very important uh, question. Now, when you say back office use, I mean, I think uh, I, uh, another thing that I think is, is uh, interesting here, we were talking about market. we started talking about marketing, but that's more market-oriented and sort of use of AI. But there are lots of, us, let's say, we go into business organizations, and one thing that I've been thinking about lately and been working with quite a lot is to understand, in, at the other end, procurement function in big organizations. How can they use AI? And then we're touching upon uh, really important issues today which concern sustainability. Because the procurement functions in big organizations, whether they are public or private, they are going to be responsible to a very large extent of dealing with um, companies and organizations' sustainability uh, issues. Uh, Understanding how the the supply systems uh, work and take care of the sort of challenges that we have concerning sustainability. And there, I think, AI... Uh, maybe it could be sort of seen as a as, as back office function, but AI there is going to be incredibly important in the future. That's my prediction for monitoring uh, sustainability in larger s- systems of suppliers or, and customers maybe also. So I think we have, um, uh, I- I- if we look upon AI as as, as as in organizations as some being more apparent and, and open and w- in the sort of, let's say, forefront, we have uh, l- lots of important back office functions. Uh, I wouldn't call maybe procurement a back office function, but it's, it's becoming more and more uh, important um, as a for, for, for different reasons. So as to say, when we talk about the sustainability aspect, it's giving companies data about what they are doing themselves that they might not necessarily exactly. have access to. And there are e- new EU rules that uh, uh, launched now in, in, in January. So within two years, it, it's a new sort of EU regulation that uh, companies need to be able to show how they are monitoring um, <coughs> sustainability, different, di- different dimensions of sustainability in the whole supply chain. So that's a new rule, so th- uh, and that ends up not so much on that sort of internal, uh, you can say, uh, sustainability function, but I- in practice it ends up very much uh, uh, on the procurement and supply chain uh, management uh, organization. Uh, on the question of transparency, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, there is an argument by a lot of companies that develop AIs that if we make our code open source and allow everyone to have access to it, uh, 
we might lose our competitive edge because we have mm. taken a lot of time to develop these. At mm. the very same time, a very large problem that we have in AI is biases and different types of uh, issues in terms of AI being racist or sexist mm. and these type mm. of issues. Yeah. To what degree have you s try, do you try to study those when you try to apply these to different organizations and at the very same time what ca if there are no regulations as they are not necessarily extremely clear at the moment mm. about these type mm. of issues yeah i i think yeah there, there's been quite a lot of trial and error i guess in, in the beginning and, and biases have of course occurred i mean for example, we studied what, that's not my research area, but HR, human relations sort of uh, management issues, and where AI was actually, start begin, they began to use it quite early in the HR functions. And, and there you, you very early came across sort of hor horrible uh, examples of, of biases in, in, in AI algorithms. So, uh, so there you can say this is this is probably some kind of learning curve here, uh, and, and it will always. Uh, but I think the more the more we sort of lift that topic to the surface, I think it's the more we also gonna be able to catch up because, uh, and as with as you say with regulations and uh, and so on, they are al always lagging behind. And that, uh, that's maybe the nature of it. We, it's very difficult to be uh, predictive of what, what's going to happen with the technology and technology use, etc. So uh, my guess is that, uh, and maybe that's a good thing with democracy, that re reg regulations, we need to take time to, to, to sort of um, fix these regulations. That's part of our sort of dem <coughs> democracy processes. But I think... The more we also use AI, the the the, the more in depth knowledge we will probably have about potential consequences and be aware of it earlier in the process. I think. Uh, I apologize that I'm taking this a bit further from our uh, core t uh, <laughs> subject of our conversation, yeah. but when it comes to regulation, especially from the aspect of economic growth. Uh, the EU has been at the very same time uh, praised and criticized for mm. the being perhaps at the forefront of the regulation part. Mm. Because many have argued that simply because they've regulated the field to such degree that compared to many other countries, uh, many companies are not necessarily too interested in developing their AIs in uh, the EU or even selling those uh, technologies okay. in uh -huh. the EU. Uh. Well, I, that's that's nothing that I've heard actually. Not not from the uh, company contacts that we have had, but that that uh, might be so. But I mean, maybe also this part of the the um, uh, how should I say uh, the the discussions and the negotiations uh, that uh, you hear such yes. ideas. Yeah, technique for convincing them to uh, yes, uh, not exactly. be too heavy yeah. on the regulation. Yeah, exactly. It's part of the rhetoric, maybe, I don't know. But uh, I think we need regulations, and that, that, that's part of it. But uh, I, I, I'm, I haven't heard in any companies that are sort of thinking about withdrawing from Europe because of these regulations. That's, that's nothing that I've heard. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, hopefully uh, we can have a that type of AI that is at the very same time has an oversight on it. Mm. Uh, yeah. But uh, just to dig slightly deeper on that point that you made about citizens and the governmental mm -hmm. uses of AI mm. and also the public sentiments towards that, there is always mm. uh, a certain degree of mistrust between governments uh, mm. and c mm. citizens mm. and the use of their data. Yeah. Uh, how would you say governments should approach that issue in terms of the uses of AI for security and public sentiment towards AI? Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a big um, big question. Uh, uh, if we start just talking about the the sentiments, uh, I, I found actually I knew I knew you sent me the question before, so I actually uh, looked into it, and and there is in 
2021, there was a big sort of uh, survey done, 17,000 respondents uh, spanning, I think it was 15 countries or something. And then they had a sort of, let's say, uh, open, uh, open-ended open responses. And they asked people, uh, these 17,000 people, uh, what do you think about AI? What, what, well, what are your associations when you hear the word AI, artificial intelligence? And and they uh, ended up when with these open-ended sort of answers. They ended up in in four types of uh, responses, or they could group the responses into four types, four types of sentiments. And the first one was uh, exciting. That is, uh, and it was related to words like good, hope, exciting, amazing, etc. The second one was also quite positive. Was useful. That is helpful, productivity, assistance, human tasks, benefits, etc. But then there were two that were a little bit more negative, and the the first one was worrying. And there you got concepts like concern, cautious, skeptical, creepy, danger, distrust, fear, bad, privacy. Uh, tracking, AI replaces humans, etc., etc. So that was the third sort of group of, of responses. And, and the, f- the, the fourth one was futuristic. That is, advanced automation, uh, world-changing, uh, alien robots, etc. So sort of futuristic-oriented. Uh, and so I think they are both uh, positive very positive and, and very negative sort of sentiments here. And I think the, the, your question there about the sort of the negative sentiments, um, I think, well, that needs to be uh, sort of uh, understood and, and taken care of and understanding why and what is it that makes people uh, sort of talking about it in terms of worrying them. I mean, the third group there. What is it that makes people worried about it? And why? Um, Because um, uh, I think there's also, I think this is not my research area, but there have been done certain experiments with with, um, AI. uh, And they've seen that sometimes uh, these, these demonstrate that humans often fail to trust an AI uh, when they actually should trust it, and the opposite, but also that humans follow an AI maybe when they should not follow an AI. So that, that some kind of um, coming back to that, maybe we need to make AI more explainable, at least try to do it, and be more pedagogical and make it explainable. So explainability and transparency maybe are two sort of key words here. Yeah, I think, especially you pointed out exactly the pedagogical aspect of it Mm. when you were talking about uh, it in the medical uh, sciences, but uh, don't you believe that there needs to be a societal education about AI from Mm. perhaps in a high school uh, type of Mm. situation because it's becoming something that is encompassing Mm. everyone's life in different aspects? Yeah, exactly. I I think so. And um, maybe I think it, it comes also with this sort of fake news sort of uh, discussion. So, uh, w- I mean, AI is part of that. Uh, so I think, uh, and we've seen that in schools, there is uh, much more attention to these uh, things in schools, the learning pupils and students to understand how is a fake news created? What is, how is it that we can actually do it? So that maybe that's part of that discussion. So I think it's, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's uh, um, uh, but uh, maybe this, this is more of the pedagogical challenge. How do we make it more pedagogical? So uh, we need sort of uh, more uh, more research on that. And uh, maybe we need r- research from very many different areas, uh, um, psychology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to, to sort of uh, create this uh, explainability. Mm. Now, uh, bringing our conversation a bit back about the organizational uses of AI, uh, when it comes to the more front-end uses of AI, uh, is it something that people will be interacting with much more? S- things like ChatGPT uh, can be an example of that. And 
implementing that in many different uh, organizations and aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what approaches can companies and governments uh, take there? Yeah, I think um, I, I think we will see much much more uh, use of, of of AI in different functions and m- more sort of open use of it, but. Sort of how they should, uh, how should they sort of approach it? So well, I'm, I'm coming back to that. That is uh, um, understanding basically what AI is and what AI is not, uh, and then identify and analyze what are the sort of current problems that we're dealing with, uh, and then I I would say to sort of if if things are going to happen here, I think. You need to sort of um, ensure some kind of buy-in and management of this, if it's going to work. Uh, as I said, maybe previously in the start, maybe it was sort of connected to certain I- internal specific functions that we're using it and uh, application areas. But I think uh, on a broader scale and in the future, I think we need to sort of lift it up to m- more. Of a s- it's a leadership issue. Uh, management issue um, and also I think w- one part of that maybe that's part of the sort of the the next step how can organizations um, adopt a more strong I would say data driven culture whether it's a public or a private organization because that that is the sort of uh, I think part of the essence of it uh, if it's going to be uh, adopted in on, on broader scale in organizations and not just only to specific functions, how can a total organization become more data driven? So I think that that's uh, also part of this this issue. Um, and um, yeah, and of course, I think you touched upon it earlier. Uh, and this maybe it's a timing issue and how how markets would concerning AI develops, decide on whether it could be or should be uh, in-house development or whether it can sort of be outsourced. When we talk about outsourcing mm. it mm. or developing in-source, mm. is there a uh, economic curve for when a company should consider developing <laughs> their own uh, AI? Yeah. I think it depends uh, very much on, on, on yeah, so many things that it depends on. I think it depends on, on of course, uh, can you afford it at this stage if you're a small company? Because uh, sometimes if it's, it's advanced, I mean, it's an uh, infrastructure, an AI infrastructure and system that needs to be in place. And maybe uh, as a small company, and you, maybe you can get access to certain part of it by, by outsourcing. It's nothing that you can develop yourself in, in, in-house, so to say. Um, so I think... Um, and maybe that's the best advice is start small and then successively maybe um, let's sort of take over and maybe develop internally. Um, I, I think that that is one um, important part. And I think w- another question today uh, is, of course, how fast can you scale this? Uh, uh, and, uh, and how fast can you scale uh, the sort of the, the data management processes that are sort of part of this also. That is, you can start small with a certain so certain activities in organizations, but then maybe for, for at least for business organizations, commercial, the one big question is, of course, how, how can you scale this use? Uh, both scale the existing, but also, uh, how should I say, let all functions become more or less uh, integrated. That is, have some kind of data-driven culture in, in the in the organization. So I think that, but we, we're maybe t- talking about more l- long-term developments because we're far from that in, in many organizations today, both public and private. Uh, on that subject, I just remember the quote from uh, Rupert Murdoch, who's been in the news a lot these mm-hmm. days, but uh, he had a sentence that uh, these days in business, it's not about big beating slow, it's about fast beating slow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so perhaps uh, that is a 
thing for many organizations to think about. But as you mentioned, the question of management and at the very same time, many businesses having to uh, think about a more data-driven approach. Mm. When we discuss more, uh, I would say, all the type of businesses that have more traditional bases mm. compared to mm. new businesses and uh, the uh, startups that have a very more energetic culture, do you think that all the businesses can catch up to this? Because mm. a very good example of this is, for example, Tesla, that mm. uh, they've been able to rapidly expand and uh, develop new technologies that many other companies have lagged behind them. But mm. examples of this can be given in many organizations. Mm. Do you think uh, startups are better situated? I think it probably depends on what kind of startup we are talking about, but, um, but, but whether it's a, s- a startup that is a sort of f- firmly situated in, in, in this sort of digitalization and, and the AI sort of um, type of, of uh, or <laughs> practices, I think then, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, they can probably uh, be more agile and, and, and work faster and, and maybe also uh, scale faster, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, but I think it's it's also a matter of uh, the, I mean we're talking about AI capabilities. So what what capacities do different organizations have to uh, adopt and, and and use AI? I think it, it one shouldn't underestimate uh, the the leadership importance here. Uh, I mean I- in the in the first phases of digitalization and digital transformation, it was mainly handed over to an IT department and an IT manager. And I think it's the same with AI. Maybe if, if it's going to be, if a big organization or a, any type of organization is going to be able to sort of adopt AI and, and maybe scale fast, then, then by necessity it's, it's important that you have some kind of strong leadership behind this. Um, and um, it, it cannot be handed over to a single sort of IT department or an IT manager to drive this. It, it's um, it, it's must up on a much, much higher level. Uh, can businesses, and this becomes a question of internal businesses, but can businesses take uh, different approaches of trying to create a management team that is thinks about these mm. issues more broadly rather than just mm. it being uh, in the hands of a few uh, IT department leaders? Mm. I think that's a, that's a very good question. What what kind of uh, uh, management support do you need to be able to sort of do this? And, and will it be different in different industries? Yes, probably. Um, I mean, coming back to, well, what what is it that is the sort of main driver of certain companies? If you if you look at from that side, whether it's a sort of pressure for sustainability issues then I'm coming back to my idea that maybe then we need to sort of lift up the procurement function much higher into the sort of in in the organizations alongside with the the sort of management Uh, whether it's a let's say a a consumer market type of of, um, or product uh, related company maybe then it's much more marketing driven uh, management group that you need to sort of have. So I think it differs depending on what, what kind of, of topics is it that it are important for the company and, and uh, w- what kind of drivers uh, there are. Uh, so I think it's um, uh, it, it depends. That's a simple answer. It depends on, on, on the business. Uh, yeah. So if we... Uh now move to a slightly broader mm-hmm. scale of uh, AI in businesses. Uh, a question that is raised with AI, again, is that uh, access to it by larger companies. Uh, but at the very same time, there is a hope within the AI community, I would say, that it would lead to a greater degree of equity. Uh, can AI lead to a more global uh, uh, scale type of development uh, in businesses and for uh, uh, companies and organizations throughout Mm -hmm. the world? 
uh, you're thinking about the sort of if if we compare developed and developing countries. Yes, example. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think. Well, th- that's a h- huge question, and it's, it's not very much on my table to say something about that. But uh, if I if you take it from my point of view, um, then my association to that question is that yes, I think we, c- and I'm positive here, and I'm, I think we can reach more uh, equality uh, with the support of AI because I th- I can see that some of the areas where AI is now uh, um, employed are areas where I think uh, we can see a, a positive effect in developing countries whether they are going the developing countries going to be able to control the AI or whether they need support from from the developed countries to to uh, to actually control or or be in charge of the AI I, I'm not sure how that's going to be handled but I, I can see this th- for example three interesting application areas of AI which affects the developing countries and that's agriculture and it's healthcare and it's education and I b- we've been studying in our project all these but I mean from an ag tech uh, from a healthcare uh, AI healthcare perspective and, and also from an ed tech perspective um, and maybe also from a little bit from our sort of uh, Western perspective, but I think I can see the applications that are coming out from these three areas could probably be used for 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 uh, and uh, create very positive effects in in developing countries. Uh, let's take the the third one for example. I mean ed tech. I mean we have had digital education tools for for years now. But the next step is, of course, to add AI uh, uh, to these ed tech tools. And, and uh, for example, we, we there's an, an a very interesting small company here here in Stockholm called Astrid Education, specialized in in English. You can say one part of it is is in English courses. Um, and with the support of AI, you can of course follow the the uh, the learning uh, of each individual. That is uh, how proficient are these uh, pupils and students when it comes to to vocabulary, pronunciation, grammar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you can follow it with the help of AI. I mean, educating uh, large populations which are n- not si- situated in big sort of let's say African cities somewhere in Africa, but also living uh, outside of the big cities because o- everybody has a mobile phone today almost. Uh, so I, th- I and there, if these countries could get access to these rather smart and, and efficient new AI-based ed, ed tech tools, then I can see a, a positive effect of it. Who is going to control it? That's another question. Can can the uh, can it also be be uh, partly in, in 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 the hands of of these countries? And I think that's maybe. Uh, that's the next question. I mean, I, s- I see the same thing happening in ag tech, agricultural technology, where AI is becoming part of, of these new uh, smart agricultural systems. That is, you know exactly how much water every single plant needs with the support of AI. So you can, you can become much, much more efficient in, in, in your use of pesticides or, or in use of water, etc., etc. So, uh, I mean... Agriculture questions are very much part of, of the the issues that developing countries are dealing with, and here I, I see, at least in our world, that AI is becoming part of these systems. But how we how can we let these developing countries get access to this? I mean, that's the the, the question. Can it be some sort of AI as aid, basically? Mm, maybe think? so. Yeah. And the same in, in healthcare, sort of monitoring people's health. And then, of course, we have the sort of privacy and, and issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but still, I mean, there are now tools, for example, in, in agriculture, in education, and in healthcare, which I think could be incredibly useful for, for the developing countries, and, and uh, at least in the long run. When we discuss 
these diff- many different and very broad uh, applications of AI in education, mm. agriculture, mm. health, and many other different sectors. There is the question that, and as you mentioned, the public sentiment that some consider AI to be a worrying thing. Mm. And uh, there is a split between the AI community that the a more broader and generalized AI systems will lead to uh, basically all jobs vanishing one day, <laughs> or not necessarily all jobs, um, but uh, mm. very many jobs, mm. uh, or not. Mm. Uh, and also there is the p- uh, question of public sentiment towards mm. many jobs at least mm. definitely vanishing. Perhaps mm. now that will lead to new jobs being created. But... Mm. Mm. Uh, what can businesses and uh, governments do you think do to try to alleviate or uh, at least readjust themselves to that? Yeah, th- that's a huge. Yeah, <laughs> I apologize. It is yeah, both at, uh, but you know, uh, just yeah, as a matter yeah. of discussion. Let's yeah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, sort of my very personal take on that is that. Um, is that I yes I, I can see the worry but you take it from the positive side yes new new types of jobs will be created uh, and um, it, it's just a matter of how we manage I think these transition phases how can we make the transitions uh, s- smoother in some way so that people don't uh, lose their jobs etc but I think we shouldn't shouldn't underestimate I can understand the worries, of course, but um, also if you turn and and look at it from the other perspective, you can say that many of these first jobs that are disappearing are probably very tedious jobs that maybe it's better that machines are doing. Uh, And and that's one aspect of it. And the second one is that, well, how can we actually uh, use, taking the opportunity to create completely new types of jobs and everybody can't of course become an AI engineer or, or algorithm developer or whatever but but they are around the use of AI there will be new jobs created and if we can sort of balance that in some way over time but um, th- th- that's uh, that's not my headache. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I so absolutely how understand. This I do apologize, be, but I've got a transition is gonna uh, be economist in front of me. I had to <laughs> ask some yeah. questions. Well, uh, I, I think an, uh, an economist. Uh, well, I'm not. A, I'm, I'm sort of. I'm doing research in business administration. You can say, but an economist would probably have some interesting models and ideas for for how this could be managed on on the macro scale. Uh, but. Uh, I just thought about the fact that you mentioned that organizations can use AI for innovation. Mm. And we also discussed the fact that managements might not necessarily be able to be very, sometimes, uh, if they don't have the required knowledge front-footed on it. Mm. Can AI solve that problem by itself, basically? If we talk about more generalized uh, AI, it uh, it is a relatively innovative thing on its own. Mm. So do you think a management leadership can be to such degree influenced by an AI that it becomes an innovative company even though the management does not have a... Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I mean, over the years, of course, we've seen that in new technologies in the hands of people, whether they are... Um, irrespective of where they are in an organization, whether they belong to the sort of management or, or any other... Uh, we have always seen sort of very surprising consequences of people and people's innovativeness when it comes to uh, adopting and, and uh, using uh, new technologies. That's always been so, I think. And, and I think AI uh, is a, it's the same with AI, that uh, we... I, th- I don't think we can anticipate what's going to happen uh, in the future with uh, AI coming more in the hands of, of innovative users. And that's, I think, is a sort of... Yeah, I mean, of course, it could be 
bad consequences, but I think that's also part of the very positive side of it. AI being sort of adopted by uh, people with innovative skills. I think that's a, that's a good thing. Hopefully it will lead <laughs> to a very better future for all yeah, of us. But yeah. uh, now I have to come to the part of the interview where I, at every discussion, I basically uh, <laughs> ask uh, about uh, artificial general intelligence, uh, which could, uh, if we describe it as something that can ha- uh, compete with human intelligence. And uh, some companies are trying to develop that. Many in AI doubt whether or not it will be possible or uh, how far we are from it. But if AGI uh, is ever developed, what do you think the organizational uh, and uh, governmental impacts of it and societal impacts of it mm-hmm. will be? Uh, I, I'm not sure. That's, it's, it's an incredibly difficult question to say, but I think I, I would pull down the question back to the question to a uh, very concrete level. That is... Uh, there will always be humans and there will be sort of AI systems. And I, I think it's, uh, at least for a long time ahead, uh, we, what we have to tackle is, is uh, the combination. How, uh, how is humans and human decision-making is going to be uh, sort of interacting with this sort of AI systems and, and, and the... the, the the things that AI systems can 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 assist with uh, in in human decision making. So I think uh, coming down to the understanding that in detail, I think that's the most uh, uh, important thing here, because then we can probably also steer it in a direction, or it will be at least easier to steer it in a certain direction. That is uh, how uh, we as humans are uh, going to interact in the future with a- AI systems. But becoming much, much more aware of the, the um, uh, we can boil it down to decision making. How is, is, uh, how are hum- how is human decision making going to be affected by the increased use of AI and vice versa? How can we as humans sort of steer the uh, the sort of AI system and and, and, and the things coming out of these AI systems in, in a in a better way because I think well now it, today it's very much uh, and, and sort of um, still on I would say on the if we talk about AI as for automation and AI for augmentation I think uh, uh, and then uh, seeing AI as, as assisting humans with augmentation. I think we are not so far into that. I mean, in certain areas, of course, but I think we're, in a broad sense, organizations are still in the automation phase. So I think that's when we start stepping into the uh, augmentation phase and taking bigger step into that. I think then it's just a matter of being aware of what it is that is happening in this sort of AI, where AI is becoming the uh, assisting humans. Uh, it is a uh, psychological, perhaps, or so, uh, sociological question to mm. ask, but how important do you think is, is it for us to exactly know what is going on? From, <laughs> uh, and I mean that from a general public sentiment, and mm. also because even we as developers of AI don't exactly know what, for example, a deep learning algorithm is exactly no, is doing. No, no. So uh, mm. do you think that having a deep understanding of it is to such degree important that we have to try to even develop models yeah. that are mm. more transparent? M- today, I think maybe it's a um, difference. I mean, as a vo- sort of general, normal sort of citizen. <laughs> maybe we, uh, this explainability and the transparency, etc. maybe it, it's not that important in all cases. But I mean, if you're a medical doctor and you're going to use AI for taking sort of uh, important decisions about patients, then I probably would say that maybe then 
uh, if I were a <laughs> medical doctor, I would probably want to know what this machine learning algorithm is actually doing and how, how, how it's, uh, I mean, not, not in all detail maybe, but at, at least a little bit more than if I'm using, uh, as a consumer, using some kind of uh, chatbot function, then I, I'm not that interested in understanding how it works and what it's doing. Maybe how the understanding how the information is uh, generated and taken care of, but not in detail how it works. I think we come to a conclusion that different uh, levels of pedagogical uh, aspects have to be taken in different professions mm. for learning mm. of people. Mm. And as a final question, uh, what are your hopes and worries about AI in the future, would you say? Well... Uh, I th that's a also very sort of broad question. My hopes. Um, no, I think I, I can see. So I, um, I tend to be a sort of more positive, uh, positively oriented researcher when it comes to AI, and I, I can see so many positive uh, effects of AI. For example, as I've mentioned before, agriculture, education, uh, and and healthcare. At the same time, of course, as you can see, lots of threats, for example, in education, how, how much data should we be able to sort of store about our children and students, etc., which I think is a very worrying sort of thing. But at the same time, uh, my hopes is that, we, that uh, all the positive effects will really start growing and that we will be able to, to manage and uh, in a good way, the the uh, the worries and the threats, so the the positive side uh, weighs over. That's my hope for the future. Um, so I think yes, there are lots of worries. I think, but uh, let's hope for uh, for for the positive side becoming much much more stronger than than, than the the worrying side of it. Uh. That's a very beautiful thought indeed. Uh, Paranderson, <laughs> thank you very much for participating in this podcast. Mm, it's nice to be here.